greetings to all of you. A warm welcome to all of you, my beautiful people. Today I'm going to give you a second chapter in sitting at the feet of Jesus. And today it is, Why a Rabbi? And I give you some information of the author, her stories when she travels, and also why a rabbi. This is your Pastor Yeti. A visit to Israel makes it easier to picture many of the scenes in the Gospels. And the author says, On my most recent trip, I met a graduate student named Brian. Both of us were enrolled in a class on Second Temple Judaism, headed to a prestigious seminary on America's East Coast. Brian is unquestionably bright, but he's something else as well. With shoulder-length brown hair, a long beard, and medium built, this fair-skinned Californian is a dead ringer for Jesus. At least the one in all the Sunday school's paintings. One day our class took a dip in the Sea of Galilee. As water ran down Brian's matted hair and beard, and beard I could almost see a dove hovering over him as he stood waist deep in the lake. One day, as we were walking up to the southern steps of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, steps that Jesus would have climbed on his way up to the temple, a group of 20-something Israeli students suddenly began poking each other and pointing at Brian. Then they held out their hands, shouting, Jesus! Jesus! The students, good, natured, bantering, made it clear that they were in on the joke. Brian exactly fit the stereotype of a Hollywood Jesus. A Hollywood, I mean. A stereotype, of course, that simply and completely ignores Jesus' Semitic heritage. Now, what is a rabbi? A rabbi literally means my master. In Jesus' days, it was a term of respect for teachers of the scripture. It wasn't until after AD 70 that rabbi became a formal title. So, we move on. Though most of us have grown beyond such historically inaccurate images of Jesus. At least when it comes to movies, we often fail to realize the significance of his Jewish heritage in other respects. Just how Jesus was Jewish and how pious were the people around him. Were they as devout as the Jews on, and the author says, on her flight, El Al flight, or were most of them far more casual about their fate? And why, for that matter, should we place so much emphasis on understanding Jesus as a rabbi? Isn't it enough to know him as Redeemer and Messiah? The answer, and giving an answer to these questions, we must begin by realizing that Jesus entered historically, uh, entered history at what could be described as the best and the worst of times. It was the best of times in Israel because people were hungry to know how to live for God. And they knew for their own tragic history how painful life could become when their nation strayed from the path that God had laid out for them in Scripture. Despite this spiritual hunger, it was also the worst of times in Israel because life under the Romans was unbearably brutal. 
and not only did Rome demand oppressively high taxes, they harshly suppressed every whiff of opposition. In Sepphoris, for instance, a town just three miles from Nazareth, the Romans quelled a rebellion by burning the city to the ground and then selling its survivors into slavery. This happened in 4 BC around the time of Jesus' birth. Imagine what it would have been like growing up so close to such a disaster. It would be like being born in Manhattan on September 11, 2001. Though you hadn't witnessed the destruction of the World Trade Center towers, you would grow up hearing the story until it became seared into your mind because of their continuing oppression by the Romans. The Jewish people cried out to God daily, begging for a Messiah to deliver them. It was into this hotbed of social ferment and religious longing that the greatest of all rabbis appeared on the scene. And no wonder he attracted a crowd wherever he went. The Torah study. How my Jewish Jew, Jesus, <clears throat> excuse me, Jesus' Jewish upbringing have shaped his life and ministry. For one thing, Jesus probably began learning to read and memorize the Torah and much of the Hebrew scriptures by the time he was just five or six years old. This was a typically pattern for Jewish boys. After age 10, he would have been begun to learn the oral Torah, the rabbinic traditions handed down for inter interpreting the written Torah. And though girls were not required to have formal training in the Torah, they would frequently have heard the scriptures recited and would have been expected to know many prayers by heart, both at home and in the synagogue. By the age of 13, most boys would have concluded their formal study and then began to learn a trade. The most talented among them would have been encouraged to continue studying throughout their teenage years at the Bat Midrash, the house of interpretation, at the synagogue until they married at the age of 18 or 20. Only the most brilliant would go on to become disciples of a great rabbi. Now, what is Torah and Oral Torah? Torah is Hebrew for teaching or instructions. It refers to the first five books of the Bible and also called the Pentateuch. Christian Bibles often translate the Torah as law, while Jewish translations usually render it teaching. It sometimes is used to refer to the scriptures as a whole. The Oral Torah consists of the explanations and interpretations of the laws given to Moses in the Pentateuch, the written Torah. These were passed down in oral form by rabbinic teachers in Jesus' day. Other rabbis added to the teachings which were recorded in the Midrash, the Mishnah, I mean, around A.D. 200. Though pious Jews had a bit interested in all of scriptures, they focused primarily on the Torah, the first five books of the law that God gave Moses. For them, the Torah was not an one rose rule book or a vast catalog of laws as we might think, but a gift from God that taught them how to live. During the first century, knowledge of the scriptures was widespread, and even ordinary people devoutly studied the Torah meeting together in their local synagogues, an institution that developed during the Babylonian exile, when it was no longer possible to offer sacrifices in the Jerusalem temple. 
For both men and women, the synagogue had become the center of Jewish life. Each, each Sabbath, a member of the congregation would read from the scriptures and expound on the day's passages. Gifted rabbis like Jesus, who happened to be in town, would also be asked to speak. In the early first century, many people were involved in living and teaching their faith, not just an educated few. Jewish historian Shmuel Safrai writes, Torah study was a remarkable feather a feature in Jewish life at the time of the Second Temple and during the period following it. It was not restricted to the formal setting of school and synagogue, nor to sage only, but became an integral part of ordinary Jewish life. The Torah was studied at all possible times, and even if only a little at a time, the sound of Torah learning Issuing from houses at night was a common phenomenon. When people assembled for a Jewish occasion, such as a circumcision or a wedding, a group might withdraw to engage in study of the law. Bet Midrash. The Bet Midrash is a center for study and teaching of the Torah and its rabbinic interpretation. In the first century, it was usually located within a synagogue, serving as a high school where boys between the age of 13 and 17 studied religious texts. Adults would have continued to study there in their free time. Now, the life of a rabbi. In the centuries prior to Jesus' time, certain men distinguished themselves by their earnest desire to study and teach the Torah. In Jesus' days, a person would honor one of these learned men by addressing him as my master, which in Hebrew is rabbi. Some decades after Jesus' time, this became a formal title and these teachers became known as rabbis. For the most part, these teachers did not hail from wealthy or priestly classes, but from the ranks of ordinary folk. They could be blacksmiths, tailors, farmers, tanners, shoemakers, woodcutters, and of course, carpenters. Many of them worked seasonally traveling and teaching in the months when they were free. Rabbis interpreted the Torah, explained the scriptures, and told parables. Some traveled from villages to villages, teaching in synagogues, though they relied on the hospitality of others. Rabbis were never paid. They often took disciples who would study under their directions for years, traveling with them everywhere they went. Study sessions were often conducted outdoors in vineyards, marked places beside a road or in an open field. Disciples would then go out on their own, holding classes in homes or in the synagogue. Now, the synagogue, what is that? A synagogue probably developed during the Babylonian exile in the 16th century BC when the Jews were unable to worship at the, Jerus the Jerusalem temple as the local community center. The synagogue served as a place where people gathered, prayed, and studied the scriptures. And in the first century, all kinds of meetings were held in the synagogue, school during the week, and prayer and study of the Torah on the Sabbath. Knowing more about the life of a rabbi sheds considerable light on the life of Jesus.
Rabbis often spent many years for far from home, first as students and then as itinerant teachers. It was not uncommon for such men to marry in their late thirties or forties. This fits perfectly with Jesus' statement that others had renounced marriages for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, and Paul's affirmation of singleness as well. Singleness was not an impossibility, but a sign of a rabbi's great commitment to God. Now, Jesus among the rabbis, as far as we know, Jesus belonged to none of the main religious groups active in the first century, Sadducees, Zealots, Essenes, or Pharisees. Still, his teaching comes close to that of the Pharisees, the group who re-established Judaism after the temple was destroyed in A.D. 70. And the rabbinic Judaism that survives today is their legacy. This may seem surprising since Jesus called the Pharisees hypocrites and a brood of vipers on at least one occasion. And sometimes the gospel seemed to imply that everything Jesus said directly contradicted the teachings of the Pharisees. But it's important to realize that debate was a central aspect of study. The rabbis believed that a mark of an excellent student was his ability to argue well. One rabbi lamented the death of his stiffest, stiffest opponent because he had no one to spare with, no one who would force him to refine his thinking, though some of Jesus' listeners tried to trap him with clever, uh, with clever questions and others debated him simply because this was how study and teaching was done. Luke's Gospel tells us that Jesus had been teaching in synagogues even before his ministry formally began in Luke chapter 4, 15. Why is this important? Because it tells us two things about Jesus' Jewish reality. First, Jesus must have been quite learned by the standards of his time. If not, he would never have been invited to teach. Even his toughest critics never questioned his scholarship. And second, Jesus must have been observant of the Torah. If he hadn't been, he would have been buried from even attending the synagogue, and let alone speaking in it. So it seems clear that Jesus was an integral part of the Jewish world of his day making sophisticated contributions to the high level of conversations that was going on among the rabbis of his time. Other than reading through the Gospels, how can we get a feel for the Jewish thinking of Jesus' day? Surprisingly, some of what was under discussion in the first century is still being discussed and studied by Jewish today. The Jewish people considered the oral Torah, the teaching of the rabbis of Jesus' time, authoritative, as though it had been given by God to Moses on Mount Sinai, when the written Torah was given. This oral tradition was finally written down around A.D. 200 in a book called the Mishnah, composed primarily of legal rulings. The Mishnah preserves the discussions of Jewish thinkers, from between 200 BC and AD 200. And over the next few centuries, the, Mis the Mishnah was compiled together with an expansive co commentary into the Talmud and completed around AD 500. And for the past 2,000 years, the discussions contained into the Mishnah and Talmud have formed the main body of the study for Orthodox Jews even up to the present day. Now what is Talmud? The Talmud is a large volume of commentary on the Mishnah. The commentary is printed section by section following each verse of the Mishnah. There are two Talmuds, the Jerusalem or 
Palestinian, the Talmud completed about AD 400, and the Babylonian Talmud completed about AD 500. The Babylonian Talmud is considered authoritative by Jews today. So, in fact, Jesus lived in the midst of a golden age of study that provided the germinating seed of Jewish thought today. And two of its founding thinkers, Hillel and Shammai, were teaching immediately prior to Jesus' time between 30 B.C. and A.D. 10. And many of the debates between the disciples of Hillel and Shammai are preserved in the Mishnah. And more than once, Jesus was asked to comment on their ruling. When Jesus was quiet on his opinion on divorce, for instance, he was being asked which side he took between their two camps. And sometimes Jesus agreed with other rabbis, and sometimes he went beyond their thinking, building on their ideas and bringing them to a new level. A rabbi as redeemer. And there is so much more to say of what a rabbi is, but we are here sitting at the feet of Jesus. And I give you some insight in the life of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So by comparing Jesus to other rabbis of his time, we do not mean to imply that he is just another rabbi nor are we merely singling him out as a rabbi among rabbis. Much as you might distinguish an Olympic gold medalist from other athletes, Jesus was an extraordinary rabbi, but he was so much more than that. Remember that the Jewish people longed for a Messiah, a deliverer, who would be like Moses. And many of Jesus' contemporaries were looking for a new Moses to deliver them from their Roman oppressors. But did you know that Moses is revered not only as Israel's great deliverer, but as Israel's great teacher? In fact, he is often called Moshe, Rabinu, Moses, our rabbi, and by the Jewish people who honor him for bringing them the Torah after his encounter with God, with God on Mount Sinai. Like Moses, Jesus brought God's word to earth, and more than that, he was God's word incarnated. With this in mind, it is hardly surprising that he spent his life as a Jewish rabbi. In both life and death, he is our great teacher, redeeming us so that we can learn from him how to live. Imagine for a moment that you pose the sheet music of the most beautiful piano concerto ever written, but you have never heard the whole piece perfectly performed. And one day you meet the composer's son, who is himself a great pianist. This man knows his father's music by heart, and he sits down to play with the orchestra. The music is so agingly beautiful that you begin to weep. At last, you are hearing the most magnificent concerto in the world being played, exactly as the composer intended. This is a rough analogy of what Jesus has done for us, not merely telling us, but showing us what human beings created in God's image were meant to become. In addition to pointing toward a deliverer, like Moses, the scriptures also promised a king whose reign, reign would be a glorious as that of King David, Israel's great monarch. But what does being a king have to do with being a rabbi? Let's look for a moment at Jewish thinking about what a messianic king might look like. Orthodox rabbi 
Mayor Plodowski points out that the scriptures predict the, mess- the Messianic king will be a great teacher of the Torah. The Messianic king, he writes, plays a unique role. He is as first citizen of the nation as the living embodiment of Torah. He goes on to say that as the holder of the immense and almost unbridled power, he submits to the laws in the scriptures, which he carries with him at all times. And he does not rest until his people know the rigors of Torah study. And rather than being above the law, the king is to be the best possible role model for living out the Torah. His modern rabbi is basing his thoughts on Deuteronomy 17, which talks about the qualities God desires in a king. Be sure to appoint over you a king the Lord your God chooses. When he takes the throne of his kingdom, he is to write for himself on a scroll a copy of this law. It is to be with him, and he is to read it all the days of his life, so that he may learn to revere the Lord his God and follow carefully of the words of his law and these decrees. The mission of a rabbi was to become a living example of what it means to apply God's word to one's life. A disciple apprenticed himself to a rabbi because the rabbi had saturated his life with scripture and had become a true follower of God. The disciple sought to study the next not only of scripture but of the rabbi's life for it was there that he would learn how to live out the Torah, and even more than acquiring his master's knowledge. He wanted to acquire his master's character, his eternal grasp of God's law. This approach to learning makes perfect sense. Imagine handing an instruction sheet to a five-year-old who wants to learn to ride a bike. It would be far better to begin by showing her how to ride and then putting training wheels on her bike. And then, once she's ready for the wheels to come off, she will need someone to run alongside her as she makes that first thrilling attempt. That's what the rabbi-disciple relationship was all about from ancient times. God had told his people, Be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. So often we focus on Jesus' mission on the cross to save us from our sins. As marvelous as that is, it's critical for us to grasp the importance of his mission on earth as rabbi. His goal was to raise us disciples who would become like him. As followers of Jesus, you were still called to live out the adventure of discipleship, becoming like Jesus throughout the power of his spirit at work within us. To do that, we need to tune into what he was saying by developing the ears of a first century Jew. As we do, we'll discover that there are many times in the Gospels when knowing what Jesus doesn't say becomes just as important as knowing what he does say. So at the feet of the rabbi, First, Jesus quoted from the book of Deuteronomy more than any other book of the Torah. Consider reading through this, this Old Testament book to see if you can identify some of the passages he quoted. Or try scanning the cross references to Deuteronomy in the Gospels. You may want a good study Bible for this. And second, disciples were expected to know the words of their rabbi by heart. Choose a favorite quote from Rabbi Jesus and commit it to memory. See if you can make this a regular habit. And third, which type of disciple are you? A funnel, a sponge, a strainer, or a sieve?
Well, as we say, it is a full sandwich. But I hope that this study is meaning something to all of you. And may it reach not only in your head, but let it come down in your heart. And consider yourself, because you are a disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ. And let him teach you how to move on that path where he called you. And move forward, because your life has a purpose. Your life is in process to a higher source, to a deeper understanding of what Christ wants to give you. And let it be so that your life is a given life to so many others. Don't be afraid to tell about him. Don't be ashamed about him. Remember that he gave himself completely. May God bless your heart, my dear ones. This is your Pastor Yeti. Bye.